if you look at Elizabeth in the 30s, uh, the 20s and 30s, she's the breath of fresh air. She's the one who actually really brings in affection and going and playing in the highlands and playing in gardens and playing at horses and, and having a sense of fun. By the 80s and 90s, because she's old, all of a sudden she's a figure for sort of hatchet-faced tradition. You know, people will say she lived with with Edwardian extravagance until 2002. And sometimes, you know, that was sort of criticised in certain sections of the media. But I don't remember anyone caring. Like, it's, it, she kind of, the, the public didn't, they were like, fine, let her do what she, like, there was sort of an attitude with the Queen Mother, like, she wants 12 to lunch, like, you know, there was, let her have it. She's sort of a song of ice and fire to sort of pinch from another popular TV show because on the one hand there's great warmth and on the other hand there is, I mean, absolutely you would not want to be Elizabeth's enemy. Not because she resorted to sort of Machiavellian schemes to ruin your life, but simply because she cut you, that was it, there was no coming back. Hello, Royal History Geeks. We have the privilege to once again be joined by the legendary Gareth Russell. Gareth, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. That's very kind. I see you've got a cup of, well, a cup of something. How how, <laughs> <laughs> how are you? Are you are you relaxed? Are you ready for, for another intense grilling? Absolutely. Grill away like St. Lawrence. Wonderful. Well, we are here today because Gareth has recently um, re- released another book, uh, this time uh, focusing on someone who lived throughout the 20th century, which was, of course, the, a lady best known to us as the Queen Mother. And the wonderful new book called Do Let's Have um, Another Drink is available in good bookstores near you now. So do check it out if you haven't already done so. So, Gareth, the last Queen Consort of England that you wrote about to the extent that you've written about the Queen Mother was, of course, Catherine Howard. So Mm. one 16th century queen who died very young, who I don't think many would argue had a particularly successful um, legacy or tenure yeah. as queen. Fast forwarding to a woman who lived throughout every year of the of the twentieth century, who is probably one of the most successful queen consorts in history. What made you, if you like, jump from one to the other? I appreciate it wasn't an immediate jump. I, I suppose I didn't really think about it until I was writing the author's note, in the introduction for the final edition of Do Let's Have Another Drink. I mean, they are pretty much a study in contrast. You say Catherine was queen for 16 months. Elizabeth was a major public figure from 1923 to 2002. <laughs> so even chronologically, they're very different. Uh, and I suppose, actually, I mean, it's, uh, one of the, the things that people often say about Catherine Howard, which I, is just completely untrue, is that there isn't a lot, that there isn't enough sources on Catherine. That is categorically untrue. There are more sources for Catherine's private life than there are for for nearly any of her contemporaries. You have pages upon pages of servants' testimonials. And in some ways, actually, Catherine left more of a paper trail in certain aspects of her life than Elizabeth did. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Catherine's, apart from one missing confession with Catherine, most of the major pieces of paperwork are there. So you could, to some extent, uh, reconstruct a lot of what Catherine felt and thought and crucially what she said in a way that that with Elizabeth at certain times you you can't. Obviously then the flip side is there are many more letters from people who knew Elizabeth than people who knew Catherine. So, and there's footage as well. So in some cases it was, it was um, Catherine was easier to write about in some cases Elizabeth was, but also it's just they're very different tonal books. When you're writing about someone who, you know, as I say in Do Let's Have Another Drink, Elizabeth did have on and off struggles with depression her whole life. And she did um, have a surprising amount of insecurities about her appearance, which I don't think anyone really, I certainly didn't know that when I started writing the book. But in many ways, you're dealing with a life, in Catherine's case, that was brutally truncated and uh, quintessentially very unfair. That's not to say that that Catherine didn't make mistakes. Who doesn't? But at the same time, I would say if there is no way that you can look at Catherine's mistake and say that they were commensurate with what happened to her. Uh, her husband really had to push beyond the law. The law did not mandate Catherine's death. In 1542, none of her behaviour was um, technically a death penalty offence, as the House of Lords pointed out in 1542, and Henry VIII overruled them. 
Whereas with Elizabeth, whilst there is sadness there, fundamentally it was a very happy life. And that's sort of the note the book ends on. And it was a long life, a respected life. So they were they were they were queen consorts in the same country, but they had very, very different experiences, which sort of makes it interesting from an author's perspective. How do you as an author, and I guess crucially you as a historian, approach a, a 16th century figure differently to how you approach someone who was a contemporary. I mean, I'm a yeah. li- little bit older than you, but I've got very, very clear memories of, of yeah, growing up absolutely. With, with the Queen Mother and, and, and you you will have as well. How does that, is, it, is that an advantage or is that a disadvantage as a historian? It's neither, really. Um, you know, Elizabeth once asked, uh, strangely, a dinner party guest who later ended up becoming one of her biographers, Hugo Vickers. And he said, you know, she said, do you think, he was writing a biography of Vivian Lee at the time. And the Queen Mother asked him, do you think it helps to know the person? And they had a discussion about that. And he said, well, I think it helps to, it certainly helps to have met them, but I I don't think it helps to being very close friends with them. And, but I think, you know, it, it, you just, as a historian, you have to be led by the limits of the sources. You can't go beyond that. And certainly uh, with Catherine Howard, there is a desire as by the way, not just with Catherine, but with all of that generation in the Tudors, they have become avatars for certain what people want them to be Um, and they become stand-ins for stereotypes or um, modern ideas and debates and and things I mean all six of the wives do it Henry VIII does as well and I think you have to really really step back from that when you're writing it you can't you can't go into writing a biography of someone like Catherine or any of her contemporaries with the with the with the intention of demolishing myths or validating myths you can't have any of that you can't go into it in a combative mode and certainly you will come across theories that you strongly disagree with and that's every historian's right but with elizabeth it's different there's not i mean there certainly were there were a couple of um historical theories that i um was intrigued by how they were reached but um but ultimately it, it look it is a very different experience because um, you're not having you, you don't have five centuries of historical mythology over Elizabeth. But what I will say is what is very similar is that people have a tendency to project onto the royal family, you know, their about which which has happened with monarchy throughout the centuries, their values, their attitudes, there are people they like, there are people they dislike. And there are some who can take it quite personally if you like or dislike or are sympathetic or unsympathetic to someone that they um disagree with. So with both Elizabeth and Catherine, you have to sort of leave that at the door and and just trust your readers that they will that they will um, take the book in good faith. Well, I think it's very hard not to take the book in good faith. And I think, um, if I may say so, it's also hard to read Do Let's Have Another Drink and not thoroughly enjoy it. It's oh, different. Thank you. It's different to a lot of the biographies that, that we read because it's written as a series of anecdotes yeah. which bring to life stories from um from from Elizabeth's uh past as, as we should we should call her to give her one of the few names that she held throughout her whole yeah. her whole life. <laughs> yes, it's a roulette. <laughs> yeah. But I thought which again I thought you thought you managed very well as the as as the book progressed. What I was struck by, as someone who knew not lots and lots about Elizabeth, but probably more than the average person and um, what I was struck by was th- how through the anecdotes of course she came to life in a way that I don't think she's ever come to life for me before even when she was alive and Thank you. but but some of the anecdotes showed me how different and how unusual her life was to everybody else's and yeah. some showed me how she just like everybody else in some of the ways that matter and I think one of the my, I think probably my favorite anecdote was one of the early on um was about the time that one of her brothers stole her diary and forged entries in it about how she'd been overeating yeah Um, and i just wondered whether you thought that i mean anyone with a sibling could relate to the humor in that absolutely (laughs) someone with three (laughs) exactly and uh, to to what extent do you think she brought that very normal, relaxed sense of family, mm. which mm. I think by her own critique had been lacking in the royal family? Absolutely. Do we, Absolutely. What does it, did she bring that into the royal family? She really did. And and, the, and there's more in the book. I mean, there's a really touching anecdote that I did not know and was tipped off by, a fr- by one of her friends and then went looking for it and found the, the documentary proof of it. But she suffered... Um, in the 1930s, she'd sort of an on and off battle with pneumonia quite a bit. Um, 
And at one point she was very concerned. Obviously, as we all know, tragically, pneumonia can sometimes develop into sepsis. So there's a risk with pneumonia, a progressive pneumonia. And she was quite concerned that, that she would die and that her husband, the future George VI, would be left to, to, to raise Elizabeth and Margaret without her. And she left notes for him, parenting tips to find when she was gone. And one of them says, you know, don't shout or at or belittle your children the way your father did with you. Look at the relationship you have with your father. This is King George V. Not, and there's this really scorcher of a line where she says, none of your father's children are his friends because of how he speaks to them. And she really did bring in a sense of great fun. And it's interesting. I What, what I'm always interested in, and it, the monarchy sort of is, is um, the struggles of every life magnified onto a grand stage. It's so interesting that if you look at Elizabeth in the 30s, uh, the 20s and 30s, she's the breath of fresh air. She's the one who actually really brings in affection and going and playing in the highlands and playing in gardens and playing at horses and, and having a sense of fun. By the 80s and 90s, because she's old, all of a sudden she's a figure for sort of hatchet-faced tradition. And it's interesting to me what we do, not just to, to women in public life, but how we shift people as they get old. There is a certain callousness that we we foist onto the reputations of people as they grow old. And this book did, did really make that clear to me. But to answer your question, she she brought in a real, real sense of warmth because Bear in mind, her parents-in-law, King George V and Queen Mary, did, you know, the relationship really was kind of an arranged one. And while and Mary, Queen Mary was a sort of, you know, pluralist kiloise, what they used to say, like this ultra, ultra royalist. Mm -hmm. And 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 she, I think, deferred to George V a lot. And George V was many things. Um a good father to his sons is, I do not think, is one of the things you could give him credit for. And he was a martinet. And he was, you know, that that image of the royal family is not being particularly tactile or affectionate. That really is George V. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that, of course, George V was um, the king that modernised in the sense that he encouraged yeah. his children to marry non-royals, which mm -hmm. is how one of the ways that perhaps in the generation before Elizabeth would not have, she may have caught the eye of of a prince of the blood, but she would not have been, she would never have become yeah. his his duchess. But it's interesting, though, that it's very easy because we know that. Um, to think, oh, well, Elizabeth was somehow normal, but of course she wasn't. She was no. from an incredibly unusual background, yeah. e even even by the standards of, of the day. And what, again, your book really hammered home to me was how much she maintained, really, I think, the traditions of her upbringing Absolutely. really to, to yeah. her dying day. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit and, and, and sort of give your view on to how much she was an anachronism even in her own time or at what stage she became one. I don't know if she, it's interesting because I, I don't, it's, in, well, I, you can probably back me up on this. You know, people will say she lived with what, with Edwardian extravagance until 2002. And sometimes, quite a, you know, that was sort of criticized in certain sections of the media, but I don't remember anyone caring. Like it's, it, she kind of, the, the public didn't, they were like, fine, let her do what she, like, there was sort of an attitude with the Queen Mother, like she wants 12 to lunch, like, you know, there was, let her have it. No, I don't remember anyone ever publicly ever really in the kind of the, the, the general British public ever really seeming that annoyed about the, the way the Queen Mother continued to live as, you know, Downton Abbey up until the, the age of the internet. And and certainly, you know, she she was someone who believed in a set way of doing things. I mean, really, the, the country, the, well, obviously, country houses still exist. There are still people who own them still have weekends. But in terms of that, the way she did it, that was probably dead by the 70s. Mm. Really, I mean, pro, I mean, really, the, 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 the country house system had been creaking really by the time she was born. And and people who've seen Downton Abbey to sort of re-reference that will, will remember that's a major plot point in mm. all six seasons. Um, even in season one, it starts, I think, in 19, it does start in 1912. There, the, 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 the tensions are there. And, you know, Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's family were downsizing, even in the 1920s. But she, um, 
I think the real acceleration when it really the wheels started to come off the wagon were about the late 1940s under the Attlee uh, government. And then by the 70s and 80s, that it was an anachronism in most other places, obviously not totally places like the Duke of Norfolk, the Duke of Buccleuch, um, Duke of Westminster. You still had very, very wealthy peers. But but really, the Queen Mother was, uh, you know, as Ingrid Seward called her in her fantastic look at Elizabeth's daily life, the last great Edwardian lady. So, um, but I, but as I say, I don't think there was a lot of pushback from that from mm-hmm. the public. There was the the I think people forget this today. The Queen Mother regularly outpolled her daughter and Princess Diana mm-hmm. in polls of who was the most popular royal in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties. I I think there was a strong sense, particularly in the nineties and in her later years, that she she'd earned whatever she you know she she'd earned it. She may have earned it retrospectively because she was born to that privilege, but then she'd lived in a way. That, yeah. that had justified it and, and and secured it. I I suppose also as we get into the eighties and nineties, there are there are other targets of public displeasure which probably Absolutely. more prominently than the Queen Mother did. Well, I think I mean one of the things that the Crown has done that is in in terms of if you if you want to have a look at the at the sheer uh, impact the Crown can have on how we perceive figures from the past is. I mean, I I don't think I'm saying I'm speaking out of school here to say that when we, you know we were growing up. Princess Margaret was was pretty much consistently the least popular member of the royal family. I mean, it was it was a it was a she was frequently um, the butt of public jokes. If you wanted a shorthand to refer to your useless royal, it was Princess Margaret. That I mean, and when she died in two thousand and in February two thousand and two, if you look back at the coverage, overwhelmingly what people were sad about was they were saying, "Oh, the poor Queen Mother and the poor Queen." It was not about a sense of loss with Margaret. And it's really only with the very sympathetic portrayals offered by Vanessa Kirby and then Helen Bonham Carter and now forthcoming Leslie Manville that we've seen a shift in attitude. So, yeah, there absolutely were figures that um, there was no tolerance for the extravagance, mm. whereas for the Queen Mother, the opposite was true. I think that's right. I, I In 2002, I remember going to Buckingham Palace uh, upon hearing news of Princess Margaret's death to lay flowers, yeah. and I was not fighting through crowds to do it. No, um, no, no, no. And I wouldn't no. have even dreamt of, of attempting to do that. Of course, a, a few months later, when, yeah. when the Queen Mother passed away, the the public the public perception w- was entirely different. But in terms of that public perception, I think certainly I grew up understanding the Queen Mother to be a figure of warmth mm. and a figure of a, a, a fun. Perhaps I think that the, the extravagance that she was associated with almost did create, oh, she likes a party. You can't, yeah. you can't yeah. knock an old girl for, for that. What? Well, how have you found, uh, obviously you will have a much more sophisticated understanding of her than that, some of which we're going to come on and talk about. But I've been surprised how little of that has come across in the crown which obviously mm. she's been in every series so far how have you found the depiction of her well from a from a purely selfish perspective um it's been quite good for me because they left out all of the zingers and the sense of humor which meant i was able to write a, a fresh book on them um uh, well well just a, just a sort of a caveat uh, at the time of recording this, the, the sixth, fifth season of The Crown isn't out yet. I have seen um, a review, a, pr- a review of the season where they mention Marsha Warren, who takes over uh, for the Queen Mother in season five, apparently does make a few more jokes in, in season five. We'll see. Um, the Queen Mother was a really interesting one because I, I'm not someone who usually gets very antsy about historical accuracy and period dramas uh, you know that's what a non-fiction book is for i i get a little bit uh, icky when i see a personality completely misrepresented that or when they're accused of like a, an egregious crime that they didn't commit that to me sometimes i, I, I feel a bit what you're talking about i can't think of anyone that has, that's mm-hmm. happened to in historical fiction no it never happens but no well it's, it's i mean uh, however i will say to make an exception for shakespeare he can do what he likes um but um uh, although I just realised I might have waded into your Richard the <laughs> Third, but um, let's pull it back. Let's pull it back. But, but <laughs> what I mean is, um, the the Queen Mother is is I think probably the least uh, well written of them. I shall say, um, I loved Victoria Hamilton as her in season one and season two. I love Victoria Hamilton. I wish Marion Bailey had been given more to do in season three and season four. 
I do have to say I did on from multiple levels sort of recoil at the at the episode in season four called Hereditary Principle that accused her of institutionalizing her nieces. I talk about what actually happened in Do Let's Have Another Drink. But for me, whilst that was really misrepresented the Queen Mother's role, it also misrepresented how people with um, the conditions that Nerissa and Catherine Bozlan had were, were, were dealt with in the 19, in the 20th century, not just the 1980s. And to me, when you're making a drama, I, I when you're going near how people were, were cared for, with conditions like that, I, it didn't sit well with me that it was that it was that off. Um, what had actually happened, but um, but th- there's a degeneration of the Queen Mother. I think in season one she's tough, but there are some absolutely. There's a beautiful episode uh, where she's dealing with her grief, and she goes north to Scotland to the Viners, and it is really it's it's, it's mm-hmm. first beautifully shot. It's just beautifully acted. It's a wonderful reflection on what grief does to you. She sort of becomes by season four, a bit of a character. She's always eating or sleeping. It's, it's interesting. It's just a bit, I, I don't know. I felt it was a little bit um, two dimensional mm. by, by, by season four. And she, she is the, she is by season four. She's probably the figure in the Royal family. They get the least correct. So that's, that's all I can say. Of, uh, um, but I can't comment, and I don't want to be one of these people who's commenting on season five and six. We'll see what happens. Uh, and every actor and every new iteration deserves deserves a chance. Mm. She she was, um, and as you say, she 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 had those those three dimensions, which I agree with you is is lacking in the crown. Um, but it's interesting that, in a sense, some of some of that, if you like, her realness, and I and I use realness very much loosely because I think we we've already established she did not lead a, a normal life in, in yeah. it but and she never had no. by any stretch of the imagination but there was a certain down-to-earthness about her which seemed to make her, and i i don't know if i'd fully appreciated this till reading the book that made her reviled by her own class to yeah. quite a large extent why was that well to sort of play this them the snobs at their own game i would say it wasn't quite her own class It was just the people a little bit below her. Uh, It's quite rare to find, you know, she was the daughter of an Ireland countess. It's quite rare to find dukes, marquises, earls, countesses uh, and viscounts um, insulting her in the way that the London dinner party circuit did. So um, I did get a little bit ticked. One of them was, well, not uh, someone thought it was being a little bit harsh when I referred to them as uh, baroquely named non-entities, but I stand by it. Uh, these were people who had titles, some of them had titles, that had stopped mattering centuries ago, 100 years beforehand. And they were people um, picking over the remnants of past relevance, really. The, the, you know, the people who disliked her were often... Um, bright young things who never grew up, uh, and they 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 were not people that she tended to have grown up with. That's not to say all of the criticism was not. You know, I talk about um, Willie Hamilton, the famous anti-monarchist politician, had some pretty fair criticisms of her role, not necessarily of her. You know, you have to give everyone their their um, window in a book like this. But she really. You have to understand that within a certain section of the upper classes, particularly the the the, the, the type I've just been extremely rude about, um, there is an absolute disdain for the middle and working class. I mean, there really, really is in a way that there isn't in the the old landed aristocracy. So these people have not, like Elizabeth, grown up talking to farmers and talking to tenants and being made to be polite by her mother to everyone. These are people who have a very fragile sense of social identity they have huge but fragile egos and when they see elizabeth going around and smiling and talking to people in the east end and becoming very popular with them working in middle classes it just riles all their prejudices it's quite funny though when they're calling her snobbish and and really a lot of the stories that you know when i when i mention elizabeth online some people will say oh you know she used to have, have servants brought up from the kitchen so she could laugh at them and these are sort of like, I mean, psychologically ridiculous stories, but these are stories that you can trace back to these dinner parties in the 1940s and 1930s, where they just made things up about her. And um, 
and there's some really, I mean, to, to give you an idea of this particular dinner party set, this metropolitan morality that they had, this is a group that did not consider the fact, did not consider Edward and Wallace's trip to Nazi Germany to be a problem, but did think the mm -hmm. fact Elizabeth had put on weight to be absolutely abhorrent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have to, you know. A, a whole distorted problem. Uh, yeah, a whole distorted view of the world, absolutely. So that's really interesting. And of course, although she was this great, charming figure, both as uh, as a queen that was able to connect with yeah. people, as you say, because of her background, and later um, as the queen mother who was seen as, as the nation's gran, um, yeah. or, all of those, uh, or, or great grand, perhaps, just this figure of incredible warmth. It's certainly, it's probably easy for those of us who only remember her that way yeah. to forget how, if you made an enemy of her, Hmm. you were you were pretty done there wasn't that, a lot of coming it. back from that yeah uh, how did how does one how did one make an enemy of elizabeth she's sort of a song of ice and fire to sort of pinch from another popular tv show because on the one hand there's great warmth and on the other hand there is i mean uh, absolutely you would not want to be elizabeth's enemy not because she resorted to sort of Machiavellian schemes to ruin your life but simply because she cut you that was it there was no coming back um with a few, with a few people, she thought I have to say, but for her, breaking the code, breaking the rules was the thing. You did not wash your dirty linen in public, is how she put it. Certainly, the final rupture with Princess Diana came after the Panorama interview, which now that we know the way in which Martin Bashir and certain figures at the BBC had lied to Diana and preyed on her mental health and fed her false information. It is particularly tragic that the Queen, Mother and Princess Margaret felt that the Panorama interview was all of Diana's own doing and blamed her completely for it. So I think if you really attacked the monarchy or left the side down, that was it. You were you were dead to her. And also, I think she she learned over a very long period in public life that you couldn't always trust your fr people who said you were your friends. There was a lot of sycophancy around the royals. And, you know, in one case, she was friends with a society photographer for 60 years, 50 years, sorry. And then when he died, his diaries were published and, and she realized he'd been making fun of her teeth and her wit for years behind her back. And and so she, she I think she learned to be skeptical. Um, but also, I think there, as the years went on, particularly after the abdication crisis of 1936 and the war of 39 to 45, she just had very, very, very strong morality on how you deferred to the monarchy and you protected the monarchy and you didn't um, insult or betray your friends or family. And and she was let down on on several occasions. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll talk a little bit yeah. about perhaps the most famous one in a moment. But there, of course, the, um, the Marion Crawford incident in terms of yeah. two little princesses i mean i remember it would be good for you in a minute just to explain who, who i'm talking about because i suspect a lot of people who haven't read the book yet won't know but i remember reading um two little princesses as a uh, when i was a teenager because i was very cool and um and it, it is as you say in the book it's just page after page of, of sick fancy it's not it's nothing right. that would be associated with scandal or a breach of right. trust in the same way to say but explain what that was and why that would have meant something of be a symbol of great hurt to, to elizabeth well um to anyone familiar with you know sort of an evangelical concept of sin or who grew up maybe in or or, or a catholic version as well um, Marion Crawford's book represents to Elizabeth a kind of gateway sin. And Marion Crawford was originally, a, she was a nanny, a governess to the Earl and Countess of Elgin's children. And that's how Elizabeth, then the Duchess of York, met her. And she came to be governess to Lilibet, the future Elizabeth II, and Margot, Princess Margaret. And she was very much a trusted member of the family. She was with the family through the abdication crisis of 1936 and the war. And when Princess Margaret turned 18, it was decided that they would give her a cottage in Kensington Palace grounds called Nottingham Cottage, where Marion Crawford would retire to. To give an idea of how grand a gift this was and how much the royals trusted her, Nottingham Cottage was later Prince Harry's home. It's where he proposed to Meghan Markle. And it was their home initially before they moved to um, Frogmore. So that was given to Marion Crawford. Queen Mary, um, Elizabeth's mother-in-law, paid for the decoration as a thank you gift. And Marion Crawford was then approached by an American publishing house that wanted her to write a sort of memoir of her time 
as governess to Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. And the Queen Mother initially, which I think, sorry, she was then the Queen Consort, the Queen Elizabeth, yes. she ummed an ad initially. And I think Marion took that as that it was okay to go ahead. Marion also by this point had married a, a man called Major Boothley who never saw a check he didn't like and was not uh, was um pushing her to do this book. And once Marion got involved in the with these quite rap- rapacious and greedy uh publishers, she couldn't get out of it. And Elizabeth really felt she had not given permission for this. And when the first draft arrived, on her desk. She was in holiday on Balmoral. She was absolutely horrified. And it, the reason why I make the comparison from my from my from my days of Sunday school to the, the idea of a gateway sin is that it wasn't a mortal sin in that it wasn't like some of the things that came later that really rinsed and attacked the royal family. It was incredibly affectionate. It's mm. page, uh, it, I mean, it reads like Beatrix Potter mm. at times. It really does, or like the chalet schools, if anyone read those books growing up. And I think it really was very wholesome for elizabeth it was not the tone it was that it existed at all mm-hmm. and she said to marion you know you, you you're going to get offers to to tell details of our private life i don't want people knowing what games my children played in the nursery mm-hmm. i don't want them knowing what what kind of shoes i wear in private i don't want them knowing what we have for breakfast the public don't have a right to this they have a right mm-hmm. to us to our public service mm-hmm. not to what we eat and you know drink and play and talk about in private And she felt, and I would argue she ultimately was proved right, in fairness to Elizabeth, that this was the first pebble of an avalanche. And that for Marion to have done this really was was letting the side down in a pretty reprehensible way. And so what she did was, that was it. There was no more speaking to Marion. She cut Marion dead. Nottingham Cottage was not taken off Marion, but because the Queen was no longer speaking to her, everyone else in the royal household loyally followed suit. Mm. Marion left Nottingham Cottage. She suffered a complete nervous breakdown. She went north to Scotland. She later allegedly attempted suicide. Um, And none of the royal family ever spoke to her again. Now, what I will say with this is that Whilst it is the future Queen Mother who gets a lot of the blame for this, according to Lady Astor, George VI and the future Elizabeth II and Princess Margaret were really unhappy with it as well. So I think I completely understand why Elizabeth felt the way that she did. And I think long term, you know, the idea that she, you know, she said to Marion, if you do this, we will never be able to fully trust anyone again because you were the most trusted. I fully understand Elizabeth's anger. I understand her family's frustration and and rage for a while. What I will say is I also, from having looked at it and spoken to someone who knew, I interviewed for this book, someone who knew Marianne Crawford, I did feel sorry for Marianne. I felt like she got herself in a position that she thought she had more backing from the royal family than she actually Mm -hmm. did. I think she was someone who had married late to someone who was not a good candidate. And I think she found herself trapped between a husband who was giving her terrible advice and publishers who were giving her even more Mm self-interested advice. I think she got sort of railroaded. She could not stop the decision she had made. And it's very difficult not to look at, at how much pain Marion carried for the rest of her life for writing that book and not feel very, very sorry for Mm -hmm. I, it it is. I mean, I I must say, I think I, I didn't, and I, I didn't know some of that context actually in terms of if you like Marion's side of the story and potentially believing that she had yeah. more buy in than she did. I, I could understand from the royal family's point of view. I mean, letting someone into your family is the most intimate thing to do in of any course. scenario. But but what I will say is that one of the people, sorry to interrupt, just as 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 context for this, Gareth, one of the people I spoke to, his relative had been had been cared for by Marion. In the and so he knew the, the situation fairly well, and he was very eloquent and about you know about who Marion Crawford was. So I I do I think you're absolutely right. I think I understand from the aristocracy from anyone. From, I'm sorry, not just any, if you have an, someone who is you know working for you in that position, particularly the royal family, I can understand why you you don't want 
seemingly innocuous details like what you had for breakfast i think mm. you know or what games you played i can understand why you wouldn't want that in a book it's it's a little bit and this isn't fair, perhaps a very fair analogy but if you've got if you've been burgled and you know someone's been through your private stuff and they haven't taken anything it's still incredibly evasive yeah. because it's not because it's not because there's anything there that you wouldn't even show people yourself but it's your decision to share that right. was taken away and i i, I can yeah. see the see the logic but i suppose all of that pales in terms of what the, what elizabeth would have on on the on the richter scale of um portrayal probably pales in comparison to her brother-in-law and yeah. sister-in-law the duke the duke and duchess of, of windsor or edward the eighth and mr simpson as many people will will know them it's it's clear from from other sources but including the book that that they as a couple i mean it's also very clear i think for the book as to how you feel about them as as a couple um <laughs> i think there's some gloriously opinionated moments in yeah. the book and i mean that as a complete compliment to your writing Thank style you. um were they were they right to hold elizabeth as much as they seem to have done accountable for much of their misfortune or what they perceived to be their misfortune what they perceive to be their misfortune. There is, I mean, come on, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor lived a lifestyle of unimaginable luxury that they showed absolutely no inclination to part from. Um, I'm always very skeptical of historians who tell you that they don't form strong opinions. Um, I always trust a historian who says, look, this is who I warmed to, this is who I didn't, because it means they're telling you the truth. Uh, I will say from having done this book it's an unusual thing for an elizabeth boslian biographer to say i did emerge more sympathetic to wallace going in than i than than going up coming out of this and i went going in mm. um her husband i emerged um i didn't think it was possible for me to think he was more of a public and moral disaster going in but i did i he um edward the eighth found new ways to horrify me um that they're interesting. I I actually do think that Wallace was slightly justified in in identifying her sister in law Elizabeth as someone who had really waged a vendetta against her in London high society. That being said, the Windsors did not help themselves. They 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 said some pretty unpleasant things about Elizabeth too. I do think that. Wallace was justified. Absolutely. I do think some of Elizabeth's comments about her, particularly in the 1940s, were were unjustified and unfair when she referred to her as the lowest of the low. I just thought, I mean, it was everyone saw it a moment of bad temper, but it's absolutely not true with Wallace. Wallace, like everyone had her flaws, and I don't think she's necessarily someone who I would have I maybe would have wanted to have lunch with Wallace. But I think she was fascinating and very witty and glamorous. Can't think of anything worse than having to have lunch with her husband. But the um, awful, just it was it for people will read it in the book. I understand that um, you know everyone can view the abdication crisis differently. The abdication crisis actually is not what I take issue with. Um, I so to to give a sort of familial context, my great uncle, whose death just just broke my grandmother's heart, was flying. Um, in the RAF on the day that Edward VIII was writing to the British government saying that he didn't want to leave Paris until all his luxury goods were packed up. He expected people serving in the Second World War to take time off to pack up his luxury goods, otherwise he couldn't possibly go to the Bahamas without them. And he wanted space set aside and a warship for it. This is a he was he was writing all this and still prioritizing the HRH thing for Wallace, for her to be called Her Royal Highness on the days when bombs were raining down in British cities, the children of this country were being evacuated in their thousands. He did not care. And it's very and I there is very little I can find for someone that privileged and that cluelessly self-obsessed as Edward VIII was, uh, not to shudder. And I thought, you know, here was a family like mine and millions of others sitting in blackouts, hoping that their loved ones would come back. And his concern is that his golf clubs get sent from occupied France through fascist Spain to Portugal because God forbid he has to buy new ones in the Bahamas. Like it just there's no re there's no redemption for how Edward VIII behaved in the 1940s, and when you have someone who into th this is one of, this is one of the things with Edward VIII, it you keep thinking it couldn't get worse, and then you find someone who was sitting next. By the way, this was multiple sources for this one because initially I didn't believe it, so I had to go digging. 
he was still defending Nazi policies against the Jews at dinner parties in the late 1960s and 1970s. He was actually defending what Nazi, Nazism's anti-Semitism more vocally than Oswald Mosley was. I mean, it's really, it's bone-chilling stuff. And I have to say, in Wallace's defense, as much as people try to present them as this sort of Nazi-sympathizing couple, I have to say that is true of Edward VIII. It really, I find no evidence that Wallace was... Um, pro-Nazi at all. I think she went on the trip in the 1930s. I, there, I could find nothing from the 1940s or 1950s or 1960s, apart from the fact that she was very, very good friends with Diana Mosley, apart from, which is maybe not insignificant. I know um, Anne Seba, Wallace's biographer, does not think that's an irrelevant detail. But apart from that, I could not find anything that linked her to sort of some of the ho- really morally repugnant things her husband was saying. But in terms of, so I think Edward VIII made his, well, metaphorically, obviously, made his own bed. And um, I think he he de- he destroyed his own credibility with a lot of people at home by his behavior, not in 1936, but in 1940, during the war. And also, this is a man, one thing that's in the book, by the way, in 1945, he asked, could he become the new British ambassador specifically to Argentina? And when you're someone who has multiple links to Nazis, asking can you be in a position of authority, specifically in Argentina in 1945, strikes a chill. And in fact, people in Buckingham Palace thought were shocked that that's what he asked for. So I think this is Edward VIII did discredit himself with the elite and with the people in the 1940s. But I absolutely think Wallace was justified in thinking her sister-in-law Elizabeth was too unfair towards her. So Wallace, yes, Edward, no. strong traditions and strong opinions that yeah. come from those traditions what would she make to today's royal family to the to 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 the actions of her of her her heirs and successors i suppose mm. i mean in in terms of would what would she make to camilla being being her successor as as queen consort that i don't know i i don't know i think the queen mother on the one hand i don't think would have thought it was necessarily a good idea for the marriage, for the marriage of um the then Prince of Wales and Camilla Shand, I suppose to use her, her middle name, I don't think she necessarily would have thought that was a good idea. She did have a more flexible attitude towards divorce than she's usually given credit for. Her niece Anne Boslyan was divorced and then later married Prince Georg Valdemar of Denmark, and Elizabeth did go to the wedding reception. But I do think that she would have thought that the marriage of two divorcees was problematic. You know, you have to remember Elizabeth had a very, very conservative um, Christian faith and and the sanctity of marriage was very important to her. Uh, however, I think she was completely devoted to Prince Charles. I mean, really, Charles and the Queen Mother had an, a, a very close relationship. Princess Margaret said she'd never seen a grandson as devoted to a grandmother. And the support that Camilla has given um, the king over the last few years, I think Elizabeth would have appreciated. In terms of, I think the, the current Princess of Wales has based a lot of herself on the Queen Mother. I think she they she has learned from a spectacularly successful example of, of royal public life that to see it as a marathon, not a sprint. I think with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, she certainly would have had a, a fair amount of sympathy towards their criticism towards of the media. If you look at some of the Queen Mother's letters from the 1990s, she herself was very, very critical of the media. And she felt that there was no respect for the royals, that there was an invasion of privacy, in the ta- particularly in the tabloid press. And that even some newspapers that claimed to be monarchist were were really invading their lives. So I, I don't think she would necessarily have had a gripe with Prince Harry's, um, or Prince William's actually, uh, concerns about the media. In terms of going to live abroad and doing sit-down interviews, that is something that would have been sort of anathema to her. That would have been generationally just diametrically opposite. I'm always very careful to say, you know, you cannot expect someone born in the 1900s to have the same attitude towards the press as someone born in the 1980s. But for her sitting down, and criticizing any member of your family was just something she did not believe in doing. You know, you have to remember that even in, she, in public, she didn't even criticize Edward and Wallace. It was only in private. So I think that for her, and also she was so intensely patriotic. I um, Someone who worked for her told me that many times she had said, if I had had to live abroad, I would rather have died. Be- and she was specifically talking about the Second World War, I should say. But certainly I, I don't think she would have 
I don't think from a generation generational perspective, excuse me, that she would necessarily have thought moving to America was something that she would have approved of or doing some of the interviews. But the, the decades wear on, and that's and and the only that's constant the only, does change. And I suppose the only way she could really have known about these things is if she'd been born later, and if she'd been born later, she may yeah. think differently. She may have had a different idea. I mean, she only ever did one full sit-down interview, which is 1923, and her father-in-law said, don't do that again, it's a bad idea, trust me. And Elizabeth was a great believer in the thin edge of the wedge. um, uh, Thin end of the wedge, sorry. And she really did believe that as with Marion Crawford, one pebble becomes an avalanche. Mm-hmm. So after you know doing a couple of engagement interviews, she never did another one. Mm-hmm. That that is very interesting as well, and it's one thing that comes out of the book again. I didn't didn't know this. Um, even though, as you said, she wasn't an undiluted fan of her father in law George V. Yeah, the which 1990s. was a big surprise researching this. I did yes. not. She she played a blinder in public. She was always always. Uh, and and by the way, look, you'll know this from your your own work on the monarchy george v i'm you know was a a pretty disastrous father to his sons Mm. not so much to his daughter but he um he was an exception he was an exceptional constitutional monarch and i think Mm. she she did did a lot of respect for that she and to the extent that she because uh, we've not really got time to go into this now but i dare say as a source of frustration to both of us is she was no great fan of history in many senses and that she no. she would she would not preserve something for history if she felt it needed to be destroyed for the monarchy absolutely, absolutely. she she loved which is ironic because she loved history but she did not feel that everyone needed to know everything she really didn't and you know she was someone who that michael adine one of her daughter's private secretaries called her the the ostrich or the imperial ostrich mm. because what she didn't want to see she put her head in the sand <laughs> to avoid seeing it and absolutely this was you know she did not think that her father-in-law's role in denying the romanovs mm. she only found this out in the 19 in 1981 i think she found out that the, the decision to deny the romanovs asylum in 1917 had come from her future father-in-law she didn't think that needed to be published it was elizabeth ii who said well let him publish mm. this historians find that out we're not going to get in his way so, you know, and there's more in the book about stuff that she helped cover. Mm. There's a there's a literal sport of an anecdote about a piece of 19th century documentation that she threw I, in the fire. I can believe that. I no, well, I was it. told that over lunch and I, mm. to the point where I think my, the person I was interviewing thought that I had something in my ear. I was like, so what's her? Um, I just, just kept getting them to repeat it. Mm. So, abs- yes, absolutely. She, she was someone with a... Um, I don't know, cheerful, cheerfully ruthless when it came to yeah. that. Yeah, and, and, and it is fascinating. And she obviously wanted to keep certain things private, which is understandable. But I think yeah. I, I, I've I not got to know her as well as you have through through what, through what writing the book. But I, I can't shake the feeling from the little I do know of her that she would be pleased and happy with the with the with the fair tribute that you've you've assembled. And I think oh, that's that wow. Thank that you very much. Thank you. You've done her justice. So thank you for taking time to talk us through all of well, that. Well, thank you. No, well, no, no need to thank me. Thank you very much for having me and uh, everyone for listening. Well, it's been really good fun, I know, and we'll start to see the comment section very soon. I'm sure how much people have enjoyed listening to you. So once again, um, thank you very much and good luck with whatever you're working on next. Thank you.